All right, I think we have all of our panelists now and we can begin uh, the webinar. I'm coming to you from uh, New York City, the headquarters of Child Fund Alliance. Uh, I'm the advocacy and policy advisor for a Child Fund Alliance. And I also uh, co-chair the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Actions Advocacy Working Group. The Alliance became quickly the central organizing agency for child protection issues uh, in the humanitarian sector when COVID-19 hit, largely as a result of being one of the first agencies to provide technical guidance to humanitarian actors uh, once the, the pandemic got started. And we've, the Alliance has continued uh, that service by providing thematic information and, and briefs on uh, a range of issues that arise during COVID-19. One new thing that happened uh, as a result of, in, in terms of advocacy work at the Alliance, was when COVID-19 uh, occurred and, uh, and this technical guidance was issued, there was a uh, desire by many Alliance members for advocacy information that corresponded with our technical guidance, especially for humanitarian actors who were engaged with their governments. As a result, the Alliance formed the uh, COVID-19 Advocacy Task Team, otherwise known as the CAT Team, uh, which I helped lead. And the CAT team has uh, attempted to provide uh, advocacy messaging and guidance briefs, as well as um, this, our inaugural uh, advocacy webinar, uh, which hopefully will be the beginning of a series of advocacy webinars that provide um, practical guidance to Alliance members and humanitarian actors on how to engage with governments and uh, advocate for their interests under COVID-19. As I said, I'm coming to you from New York City which was, you know, for a while, the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic um, and, uh, and, you know, for a while had a, th a third, at least, of all of the global uh, cases and, uh, you know, large number of deaths, so much so that they were uh, bringing refrigerator trucks in from, from outside the city to handle uh, the overflowing morgues. We may not be, have been a model uh, that the rest of the world should follow uh, in terms of COVID-19 response, but we learned a lot of lessons uh, which are proving helpful in the current policy of the city. In much the same way, Spain has dealt with its own COVID-19 uh, crisis and learned many lessons, uh, particularly among the civil society organizations there that are involved in child protection issues. It is our hope that this morning's webinar will provide some of those lessons to humanitarian actors and alliance members who are facing the same situations or could be as uh, they operate in countries that will soon be uh, reopening or lifting um, their confinement orders. In April, through a process of gradual reopening of their society, the Spanish government uh, went through a process of developing policies and regulations for that allow uh, uh, children first children, then adults, to go out into society to uh, after the lockdown. And uh, there were a lot of lessons that, that are applicable to lockdown restrictions that are uh, that other countries have, have adopted. And we are fortunate to have a number of people who were involved in that effort and uh, can provide us remarkable insights uh, moving forward. Our panelists for today's webinar include uh, Ricardo Ibarra, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, the direct, director of Plataforma de Infancia. For the English among you, uh, English speakers among you, that uh, is the sp uh, Spanish platform of uh, children's NGOs. Mm -hmm. uh, also Catalina Alcaraz Escribano from Cruz Roja, also known as Spanish Red Cross. Sarah Colantes, who is a policy and advocacy specialist for UNICEF Spain. And our very own Macarena Cespedes, who is uh, the director of Educo Spain, also I believe co-leads the uh, the platform of the Infancia, and uh, and she also is a uh, co-chair of the Child Fund Alliance's own advocacy task force. Thank you for um, participating, and we look forward to hearing from each of you and learning learning some more. We'll begin with um, some remarks from each of our panelists, and then uh, some questions that I will direct to them specifically about reopening of society and its impact on uh, child protection issues. We're going to begin with um, Ricardo Ibarra, the director of the Plataforma de Francia. Good morning, Christopher. Thank you very much for inviting us. Um, as you said, uh, Plataforma de Infancia is a coalition of NGOs, so around 68 uh, NGOs who are working with children's rights in Spain are part of this platform. And when all this disease uh, happened and the government started to take in measures, we decided that we have to be really 
focus on, on this issue because there will be a big impact in the life of, of children. I mean, maybe the disease doesn't have a big impact on, on children in terms of health uh, problems, but yeah, there is a lot of impact on their social and economic situation. And that was something that we were really uh, aware, especially taking into, into account that Spain has a really weak system to protect children if we do compare with uh, other European countries. I mean, we have really high rates of child poverty. It's the second country with the most rate of high poverty, uh, ch children poverty in, in Europe. And also we have a lot of problems in the educational system for the most vulnerable kids. So we were really worried how this uh, disease will impact in, in them. And especially we have a lockdown and also we are going to take another measures in order to reduce the impact of the disease. But how these measures will, will impact in the most vulnerable children. That's why as a platform, as a coalition, we try to follow up what was going on in the Congress, what different measures were taken, and if they were really focused on children's rights and if they do it uh, correctly. Um, so from the early beginning, in, in March, when the government announced that there's going to be a lockdown, we create an advocacy group with our member organizations. So the most active uh, NGOs working in this kind of advocacy and control and follow up of the policies were part of this advocacy group. And we tried to share together what was going on, what data we have, what was the impact on, on the situation, how was uh, the evolution of this situation in different backgrounds. And we try to give this information to the government um, because this was something new that we didn't uh, have a lot of information and the scenario was changing all the time. We decided we were going to have a permanent uh, meeting uh, with the government uh, every week. Uh, we have a meeting with the General Director on Children's Rights and also with the High Commission commissioner on child poverty that is another figure that we have here in, in Spain and also we have at least every week on, or every two weeks a uh, meeting with the different political parties in the in the congress in the parliament in order to have an interview and be able to tell them what was going on and what was happening with the most vulnerable children we create also a proposal of 100 measures to that should be taken by the government to guarantee the fulfillment of the, all the children's rights uh, during this uh, lockdown and after the lockdown. Uh, we also propose with other NGOs and also political parties to, to create a commission in the parliament uh, about the reconstruction process. And we were able to be part of, of it and present our proposals in parliamentary session. And that was mainly the work that we have been doing, but also besides the, the opinions of the experts of all, or organizations also we, for us it's really important that the children are part of this process. That's why we create a survey, um, just focus on the opinions of children and they were able to tell us uh, what was going on, what, what were their concerns, what their fears and what's the information they were missing. And thanks for the um, collaboration of the government. We were able to make a press conference. I mean, it's not exactly a press conference, but a TV show where children who were part of this process of survey and were able to make a participation process during some weeks, uh, they were able to discuss with some members of the government on the, the national television about their concerns and to get different information and also some proposals in order that the government have these kind of opinions into account because sometimes we forget about how these measures are impacting on the rights of the children. I will say that uh, for right now there's been many measures taken, some of them in order to in improve the situation of uh, children's rights, but also we are really concerned of uh, how the impact on the economical crisis will affect the most vulnerable children in the future. Probably will be need of more measures. So I think that will be your role in the next months to make a follow-up of this process and make new proposals in order to guarantee these rights. Thank you. I have lots of questions, but I'll, uh, I'll hold them till everyone has had a chance to make uh, some remarks. Next, we will hear from Catalina Alcaraz Escribano from Cruz Roja. 
Hello, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us to this event. It's uh, such a, a good initiative to let uh, the people know the big effort that, that we have been uh, making during this uh, month to help to be near to these children who are uh, in uh, not very good situations, especially the, this crisis, this big um, health and social and economical crisis that uh, the COVID-19 is caused. Uh, the Spanish Red Cross is a big organization in Spain. Uh, it's uh, very uh, linked and connected to uh, other associations and organizations uh, in the whole country. And all together, we are uh, coordinated with the government uh, at very di different levels, not only national level, but also uh, with the municipalities and regional governments. And as uh, Ricardo Ibarra has said, the Red Cross is one of the organizations uh, who uh, have been participating in all these processes with connection with the government. But I'm now here to explain a little bit how uh, we have worked during these months. So uh, as you see, uh, we have been working in order to help people uh, and children and families who are in this situation at home, especially families who have been uh, teachers and uh, doctors and um, entertainers for these children who are uh, in a worse situation uh, in Spain. And um, I only just saying that uh, Spanish Red Cross has uh, launched uh, an initiative, a calling for the population, and this calling is uh, called Responde, uh, which means the Red Cross response. And with this uh, calling to the, to the population and also the government and also the, the private companies, uh, we have been able to help more than 3 million people in Spain especially uh, helping them in the basic uh, needs and the and promotion of the physical and emotional health. One of the um, uh, biggest lines of work is the work with uh, children and their families. Before the situation, the organization was helping more than 83,000 children and adolescents together with their families who uh, were living in a social difficulty. And in this situation, uh, we have been adapting our methodologies and our way to help AI according to the resources that we have. I'm going to tell you a little bit what we have been doing for the children that uh, are in a poverty situation, which in our country is affecting nowadays almost two and a half million children. Uh, being poor means to uh, have uh, less access to education and to health and resources. So we are trying to help uh, people to uh, get to these resources. We have been seeing in this uh, uh, situation that the children, their physical and mental health are being worse during the lockdown situation. We have seen many cases of anxiety, fear, screen addiction, and also uh, child, little children under six years old, their development can be delayed uh, because they had no access to, uh, to parks or to play open places, uh, to play with other uh, children and uh, little access to open air and sun. And also we have been very alert to uh, some uh, situations and some factors that can um, increase the violence uh, behaviors of uh, certain adults because of the situation. Who do we help uh, exactly? We help the children and the adolescents, but also their uh, parenting figures. And uh, we are uh, very focused in very special situations, such as uh, foster families who take care for children who are in the Spanish uh, protection system. Some families they, uh, who have some ill person at, at home. Uh, some uh, children with special needs uh, with disabilities, with autism or attentional de uh, deficit disorder or some chronic eye illnesses or children who have lost a loved one during these days, children from uh, separated parents and also uh, children who are victims of uh, gender-based violence. How uh, do we support these families? Uh, what is our goal with them? Our aim is to be near them, to let them know that they are not alone that they have somebody to connect uh, regarding their relation, relational and psychological and social uh, aspects, such as how to um, improve the education of, the, of their children or how to, to leave children in the, at home. And also uh, we are uh, trying to promote the good treatment for children 
through psychological programs. These programs normally, before this situation, were held in the community, uh, in groups. But now we have adapted our um, methods to get to help these people improve their skills. So we have been uh, doing this with Skype and, uh, and WhatsApp. Uh, but we have been developing a lot of materials uh, for the, our volunteers to use with, uh, with the people, with uh, the families that were connected to us. And also we have opened a, line, a telephone line uh, for help at a national uh, level and regional levels. There were many, many families, many uh, mothers who uh, were really suffering uh, because they didn't know how to handle these children uh, in these situations. And also they, they let uh, us know their, their real concerns. We made a handbook, uh, Guía de Actividades en Familia, a handbook for, uh, uh, to promote positive parenting and also uh, some tips and some activities to do with the members of the families during the lockdown. And also uh, we have been trying to uh, support uh, the children to improve with their school uh, tasks with the tablets and, and telematic uh, support. For us, it has, it has been very important, the uh, community networking with interdisciplinary teams, with uh, all the teams uh, in our organization and together with other organizations and the local governments and regional governments and, of course, at the national level. All the information we can offer is because of our actions and uh, all the connections we have with the people. Thank you very much. We will hear from Sarah Colantes from uh, UNICEF Spain. Yes, uh, hello. Thank you very much for inviting us to, to participate in this webinar today. I would like just uh, to add two more things as regards the context. The first measures and policies considered by the government in the COVID uh, context did not take into account children. And actually, uh, all of us agree on the fact that children were very invisible, uh, in fact from the very beginning. We found that those responsible for children's rights in the government also were not having sufficient power to influence the new policies taken to fight the COVID by other ministerial departments. When turning a little bit our role uh, in this uh, crisis, I would like to draw your attention more, more on the, the role that we have played to strengthen policies. Although we have also uh, carried out other programmatic uh, activities during the, the, these months, particularly in the field of the child protection system. As regard this role on strengthening policies, we would like to distinguish like two phases. In the first phase, we, in March, we, we just uh, conducted a very rapid assessment to figure out what was the situation and focus it on the priority areas uh, for UNICEF Spain, child poverty, education protection and migration. Based on this rapid assessment, we issued a document of recommendations that we uh, sent to Directorate General for Children in Spain. And we also joined other uh, initiatives taken by uh, other organizations and also the platform of child's uh, organizations. DG Children uh, finally issued some recommendations taking into account some of our proposals uh, as well as uh, other organizations proposals as regards particularly vulnerable children in Spain. Uh, after that, in the second phase, we realized that it was very important to improve analysis and narratives through the development and publishing of policy papers. And we issue a rather a number of policy papers. One, uh, a general policy paper, an advocacy brief about UNICEF and COVID, identifying the most vulnerable groups of children so that they were included as priority group for government action, describing their situation, asking recommendations, and also including the voice of children through direct testimonies. Then we also issued uh, policy papers and documents in the field of education with proposals to ensure that children could continue learning re re remotely and also issuing several materials to explain the situation directly to children in order them to understand what was going on also as regards the education uh, situation. During phase out, we issued another document with proposals uh, regarding the exit of children after the, the lockdown 
and activities for summer vacation. And uh, for the recovery political discussions, we elaborated another advocacy brief and took part of uh, other joint initiatives led by the platform uh, of children's uh, organizations. Since uh, the very beginning, we have had permanent contact with the central and regional authorities for children. And likewise, we have held permanent contact as well with uh, members of parliaments, having uh, meetings every two, three weeks. We have also managed to bring actually what was happening to families closer to governments at uh, local, regional and uh, national level. We would also like to describe very briefly uh, the gathering role that sometimes organizations like UNICEF play. Uh, in the last month, we have developed this task in the field of uh, child and adolescent mental health. It is a priority area identified by UNICEF at a global level and experts in Spain also in the, in the COVID context. As you all know as well, there has been policy call by the UN Secretary General to urgently strengthen this policy all over the world. This was a topic rather new for UNICEF Spain, since we had not deeply worked on it before. But however, we made the decision to elaborate another document, another policy document. Uh, we normally uh, work like that uh, with the state of the question and making recommendations. And we launched a document through a communication strategy. Uh, in the research process to draft this document, we identified several political opportunities and realized that UNICEF's action in this field would entail a real added value for this uh, public policy. Why? First of all, because there was a lack of visibility of children and adolescents' mental health issues in general. Second, because it was a political, it was not, sorry, a political priority and the policymaking process was very slow human rights and children's rights approach was weak. And also the network of actors was a bit atomized with different approaches and some difficulties of understanding among them. So we realized that we could have a potential impact, particularly because it was open the drafting process of the next national mental health strategy. So uh, our advocacy has consisted of identifying the stakeholders and try to engage them around a joint action, drafting joint letters for authorities and negotiating the contact among the different experts, sending requests for meetings and trying to influence the elaboration of the new mental health strategy. All these activities are still ongoing. Experts involved have appreciated the impulse given by UNICEF. One of them told us that due to all these movements, some actions ha had already been taken by the government even before sending uh, the joint letters. Our next steps in this field will be to try to get involved in the drafting process of this mental health strategy, trying to make sure that uh, there are also considerations regarding children and adolescents in the context of uh, a pandemic. And also afterwards, the idea is to evaluate if an active role uh, of UNICEF is uh, still needed. And this will only happen if the visibility of child uh, and adolescent mental health and child rights approach is still weak after this process. Thank you very much for, for your attention. Finally, we will hear from uh, Macarena Cespedes from Educo, Spain. Thank you, Chris, and thank you to all the people who is participating in the webinar. I'm going to try to be brief. Some of the issues that I'm going to speak, some of my colleagues, they, they just mentioned in their own speeches. But one is regarding uh, how the NGOs developed the work that, they did, that we did, or how Educo developed this work, and how we have this capacity to adapt quickly and the flexibility to try to, to act very fast in crisis situation, in emergency situation. And the other one is regarding to the importance of the narrative, how the narrative can construct uh, the reality and how important is it when we want, to, we want to dialogue with the government or when we want to tell the society about one issue. For all of this, I, I just want to make a brief introduction of EDUCO. EDUCO is a global development and humanitarian action Spanish NGO. We have more than 25 years of experience in the field of children's rights and uh, especially in the protection and fighting for the right from uh, education, protection and participation. 
we are member of Child Found Alliance, that is one of the biggest alliance who is focused on child protection and, and who is uh, developing programs around the five continents. Now we are, I'm, I'm gonna back a few years because uh, I just want to, to make sure that you understand the context that we have before the crisis and, and how the crisis impact in this, in this context. Because the economic crisis, uh, the economic global crisis that we lived in 2008 a strike very strong the Spanish society, making visible at this moment some structural problems that we already have. Uh, and the crisis, the economic crisis, just put it in, uh, in, our, in front of all, of all of us and, and make the deep of these problems. As a result, poverty and social exclusion in childhood reached the 33% of, of the child population in Spain. But this average increase a lot when we are speaking about single parent households or families uh, with immigrant people, and it can increase almost un until the 50% of the, of the children in risk of, of, of poverty. We were, Spain was in 2012 in the bot at the bottom of the Europe in child poverty. This situation marks the beginning of our domestic work as EDUCO. We, we used to be a cooperation, a development cooperation NGO, but we started working in this context in Spain. And we bet then, and, and we are beating today as one of uh, our main values for working alliance, adding competencies, capacities, and forces through social entities with strong social goods and also with the schools. But all of this work changed on the 9th of March. I say the 9th of March because this day was the day that the government of Spain, the different regional governments, started taking some decisions like close the schools and all those things. Our life changed in this moment, changed in a way that nobody can imagine. And our work has to change and has to adapt quickly to the new situation. We used to work through schools, you know, we attend the children and we went to the schools. We, are, uh, we have programs in more than 200 schools in Spain. We work with more than 50 entities around the Spanish territory. And it was like, oh my God, uh, the, the schools are closed. What we are going to do right now? But this is one of the things that I want to, to put on the table and for the debate. Uh, as NGOs, we have a big advantage of, uh, with the governments, you know, with the administra public administration or institutions. We are quickly, we can adapt ourselves uh, and we have some flexibility that the public administration doesn't have. And this is a big, big advantage when we, we need to act uh, in a crisis or an emergency or something like this. One of the most important things is that when we used to work with, uh, with partners, local partners, and through them, we can open access to the families, the, the children, teachers, and all this population. And we can know from first hand what they are experiencing, what, what kind of problems they are uh, facing, and what the confinement supposed for them. And, and this is a, also a big value because this information is, is something very important when you need to, to draft your projects or when you need to start a new project. And this information also is a big value that we have when we want to, to speak with the governments. Okay, we had the obligation to act during the emergency, guarantee the basics and essential goods for the children, but we also had the responsibility to interact with public administration to coordinate and demand effective and efficient solutions, as my colleague said. And above all, of all this solution we need to ensure that we have a approach of children's rights, uh, have children's rights approach. And it was something that during the most difficult moment of the crisis here in Spain doesn't occur. The government uh, act quickly, sometimes. They create some good measures, some of them late, it's true, but good measures, social measures, but they don't, they didn't being focused on children's rights, they, they forgot, as Sarah said, for completely children's in, in those measures. Among all those things, we need, uh, we have another mandatory issue or mandatory target that is, we need to count the society also what is happening with children, what is happening with families, and what, which one are the consequences of the measure of the confinement has in the most vulnerable population that we work we used to work with. 
with the aim of to generate a coherent narrative according to the new reality we as families teachers local entities and of course we as children about what they are experienced uh, what what they feel what they hope what uh, about their fears and also what they expect about the new reality and with all this information we were able to make some uh, reports and position papers uh, regarding to the summertime and how the children has to be accounting this summer uh, about the how we are going to return to the school in september this is a big 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 point and an and issue right now how we are going to back to the school and the first thing that we need is it was to make visible children because the pandemic doesn't make this visible you know some mm -hmm. during march and april the beginning of april at the, the, the end of march and the beginning of april if we speak about children in our if the politicians speak about children they just speak them like a vector of transmission of the of the disease you know it was like okay children are more than a transmission they, they have some rights and from the night to the to the day this right was good at all they, they stopped to go to school they stopped to go outside of their house they can't go to play with their friends and all those things affect children and for a long time we have built a narrative in which childhood uh, was the future the the, the we don't consider them as a present we we always see them like the future for now they just have to go to school play and obey their parents and also we have constructed a narrative in which adolescence teenager is an you know difficult state of the light and better to be taught and strict than try to understand them and this narrative is strong right now and we need to to take a uh, broke this narrative and to start to speak about children with the importance that they already have because they are part of the society our societies right now they are in this life they are present now of course they have more future than us but they are living right now and they are in the present right now and they have a lot of things to say and a lot of opinions that we need to take in value and we need to analyze and we need to start to respond to these opinions and these things that they need and they are asking. I think that this global pandemic uh, has highlighted that we are responsible for one another. The global feeling of fragility and vulnerability has led to an, uh, an awareness of responsibility and common interest. And children and adolescents reveal that they, they value most through this survey, their education and their family. Um, and we need to, to take account that both of these spaces are relational spaces. They need relation with other people. They need, it's part of their education, it's part of, it's part of their development to have in a relational context with other, with their families, of course, but with friends and with all the other people around the communities. And just for ending, uh, if we really see this pandemic as an opportunity to strengthen fully good, to generate fairer and fairer and more equitable societies to promote values of cooperation and solidarity and solidarity then we have to start changing the way that we count things and start giving the uh, giving it importance and a space that a childhood uh, must occupy you know we need to start to listen but listen well what the child has to say what the children have to say and we need to start to act regarding to their opinions and petition and asks. Thank you. I think though I will begin with a question for um, Ricardo Ibarra about the Plataforma de Infancia. The platform was instrumental in raising safeguarding concerns, as I understand, when the government of Spain initially developed its policy uh, allowing children to go outside for a few hours each day. How critical is it that child protection organizations monitor public policy developments for these kinds of chase, uh, child safeguarding issues? And when, sh when do you think they should be brought into the policy development process? It's absolutely crucial, as you said, because uh, as Sarah said, and all my colleagues were saying, sometimes the child policies or the situation of children are invisible in the public debate uh, or in the the public process um, what they are do during the measures 
or sometimes they are not taken into account with uh, enough priority. Um, and especially for more, the most vulnerable kids. I mean, I don't know if it's because children can vote or maybe it's because there is no an economical interest, but the reality is that, that children are not always uh, put it on the agenda how they should be put it. And one example was clear in Spain, there are lockdown, the children were not able to go out and they were the, the group of age uh, with more difficulties to go out. They were the last ones who were able to, to have some access to the street, to be able to walk and go to parks. And children, for example, in the child protection system, they have even more difficulties because uh, they didn't take any specific measures to them. So they have even more, uh, they, they face more problems because of this lack of uh, um, sensibility and um, with with the kids, no. I think that's why it's important that the civil society who are working with children, uh, they should have uh, raise awareness uh, strategies and they should have a really a, a public monitoring and and have this advocacy impact because otherwise, if we don't do that, no one is going to do that. I mean, they don't have these kids; they don't have any other resource in order to raise their boys or in order to be able to show to the um, to the society what's going on that's why it's important that as as ngos we don't only intervene and we only make activities to them we also have to raise awareness we also have to have work as these strategies in order to guarantee that there we prevent these situations that we guarantee that the public policy that the, any measures uh, has to have this approach to children's rights in our case, it was critical uh, to do that. Uh, and even if, or with our old resources, we were not able to do enough. So I cannot even imagine what will happen if the NGOs were not there. If we were not uh, raising awareness with all these political documents that, that we were saying and my colleagues were commenting, because otherwise uh, they will be forgot as always. And, and that's why I think that's important, uh, our role and what we were doing. I have a follow-up question then. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, well now, there's a lot of consultation that has been done to try to find out children's perspectives on, uh, on, on COVID-19 and the lockdown uh, procedures, you know, how they feel about it. But how should uh, civil society organizations like, like your members in the platform translate those perspectives into policy reform proposals? I mean, children can't obviously speak in terms of policy so what can we do how can we translate those into policy reforms that's important that we have a group of experts that would be able to to make this uh, the, this channel i mean that we were able to see what's the reality and to be able to make proposals in our case for example because this is a new reality the pandemic and the, the situation with the COVID, and that's something that we were not ready for us, it was crucial to see what's going on in other countries. And we have another platform with Eurotile, with, it's like the coalition at NGOs and European level. So we were seeing what other countries were doing, like, for example, Italy, who has a um, uh, similar reality that we have. And we were seeing what was going on, what was uh, more or less success in that sense. And we were able to make the, our own proposals in our advocacy groups. We were having always meetings or with all the NGOs and we take the experience of all the organizations and their knowledge and their expertise. And with all this information, we make concrete policy proposals with evidence in order to guarantee that this proposal has an evidence uh, in the background. So it's guaranteed that we'll have a positive effect on the situation of children's rights. But also, as you said, we, we have to have also channels of child participation in order to guarantee that also we hear what the children have to propose because maybe they, they cannot give the concrete proposal, but for sure they will be able to know what's going on, what's their problems, and then we can find a solution together with them. And we were also doing that, but we have to be ready. We, have to, we cannot do this from one day to another. We have to create these structures, these platforms, these working groups, these networks, in order that we are prepared to be able to be active when something like this happens. To Catalina uh, Escribano, very few of us uh, had any experience, as, as, uh, as Ricardo had sort of mentioned, prior to coronavirus of operating as, as organizations during a pandemic. I mean, very few of us have been party to a pandemic. How can humanitarian actors prepare their relationships 
uh, with government officials prior to a crisis like COVID-19 so that they can be a useful resource for governments when a crisis like this actually hits? It's, it's not easy. It's, it, I think it's one of the, of the, of the most difficult tasks uh, in general, especially in our uh, society, you know, the networking to work together, looking to a goal, to a common goal. Uh, the Spanish Red Cross in, the, in, in, all, in all around the country, in the different, from, the, from the municipality uh, to, the, to the national level, we work always together with our partners, uh, which are in some cases companies or people who want to help with a small uh, uh, you know, you know, business but uh, also with the with, with the government we uh, try to look uh, what is what is what is missed in the in the situation and the spanish red cross uh, tries to uh, to fill to fill uh, to fulfill the these gaps uh, what is uh, what is missed in the situations and uh, in this path we we are making we are uh, you know knitting the nets uh, to, to to protect all these people who are in the in most uh, vulnerable situations and I think that that's the, the key, the, the most important key to, to solve what you are now asking. But it's, a, it's very, very difficult because uh, we managed to, um, to put together a different uh, interests interest and different points of view and different uh, uh, goals. But when you look to the child right, uh, you know, all together uh, look to that goal, uh, it's, a, it's more, it's, a, it's easier. But I think that's a key. And because we have uh, a lot of uh, work uh, done together, n now it's been easier to understand each other in this uh, uh, context. Yeah, I agree. I often find maintaining focus on the shared goal is, 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 is key to building those relationships, always keeping uh, uh, the interests of children in mind. Um, Sarah Calantes, uh, UNICEF is often called upon to act as a kind of uh, mediator and facilitate the relationship between civil society organizations and, uh, and host governments. Uh, for countries where COVID-19 confinement orders may uh, soon be lifted, how can humanitarian actors and civil society organizations engage UNICEF uh, to help build these relationships where government officials see them as a critical resource to consult well before taking uh, any actions like uh, decisions to lift lockdown restrictions? How, how should they engage UNICEF with this help? Well, as you said, uh, it's true that UNICEF used, to, used to, to play this kind of role and also be in touch, in continuous contact with the government. But at the same time, we always try to work within networks in order to encourage uh, joint actions. Well, at the beginning of the process, we have been quite uh, cautious on our communications on this particular issue of the, of the lockdown of children. Actually, we have respected any time the decisions of the Ministry of Health, knowing that uh, they were trying decisions based on the current state of knowledge about the pandemic. So more new knowledge was normally followed by new measures. And we could see that this was uh, the aptitude, uh, in a sense, uh, in, in, the, in the government. But however, we quickly started to go back to children and other stakeholders to know how they were feeling uh, about it and uh, the problems that were arising. Actually, uh, we did this through the child councils of cities, taking part of the child friendly city program of UNICEF. Uh, we proceed then to give more visibility to their voice and ask to reduce lockdown restrictions for them in bilateral meetings with the governments at uh, uh, national and also regional and, and local levels, as well as using communication tools. Uh, Directory General for Children at Central Level, as I said, before did not have enough power within the government in the COVID crisis. So it's very, very well dominated by the Ministry of Health. And uh, we could raise about doing something and they were trying, but how difficult were for them to influence, real influence other uh, ministerial departments, right? 
That's why I think that we we'll all realize how important was that civil society and other organizations at UNICEF started to make noise more about uh, this. One important piece of work that we have done is to help the government to know how to make it, how to do it, how to allow children to come back to, to the street and to the school and to the parks. And we did this through guides. So recommendations to come back to a school. So we issued uh, several guides and we also recommendations to create safe spaces for children in cities through our World Child Friendly City program. And also we have also pushed for conversations with participations even of the government about how to organize summer vacation, for example. So I think it was very important to offer how to do it, right? And uh, in this uh, regard, I would like just to finish saying that the platform of international cooperation led by Ricardo has played a very much gathering and mediator role in this field. So the same role that UNICEF could have played, uh, it has been very successfully played by, by the platform. And we have developing this gathering role more in the field of mental health, for example. As I said before, we were very attentive to coordinate among us in order not to double work, but also to be very uh, complementary with, among the different uh, organizations. We were being very, very well uh, coordinated. Marco Ernest Espredes, Ricardo was mentioning how children, there's not a, they're not a, a ready-made constituency. They don't vote. They don't have their own sort of economic power and thus uh, their interests have to be sort of translated by civil society. How, how, how do we overcome that? How, how do uh, we get government officials to understand the importance of this constituency if they don't have a right to vote and can't often speak for themselves or exercise economic power? Right. This is a talent that we all, of, uh, all of us we have, you know, but I think that the work that we used to do um, as Sarah was explaining with the platform and uh, all of us as NGOs, is just to make noise, to make noise regarding to the ch to child rights, and also to understand that they have problems right now. Children have has problems, you know. They are not just children who live happy in their houses. And in this context, in our context, in the Spanish context, we have a lot of problems with children. We have a lot of child poverty, as a, as we told before, and violence and we have a big big problem uh, regarding drop off of school of the children we have a very high rate one of the highest rate of drop off drop off, uh, drop off of school children in in europe you know when when you are speaking about a crisis of course you can you can have some different kind of emergencies of crisis and of course it could be possible that children hasn't be the most vulnerable population as uh, as happening with this uh, pandemic, you know, because in health issues or in in health terms, they they weren't they weren't uh, vulnerable at all. But the consequences of the crisis and the measures that the government has to take to to ensure that we can control the pandemic has a big 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 impact in the life of the children. It, a lot of impact and we need to consider what they need for example sarah was speaking about how we are going to back to the school okay we can discuss a lot about how we can back to the school but we need to ask children we need to ask teenagers we need to ask younger people what they need for back to the school because if we don't ask them we are going to make this the things again without them and we're going to have the same problems again and again and again I don't know how to convince politicians and governments and institutions about the importance to our children and to take in account their opinions and their decisions, but, but it's one of the challenges that we have in front of us and, and, and we need to afford and we need to, to get it because it's something really important. Maybe the, the solution is start to, to change the social construction that we have about children. They are not private person of their parents. They, they are not just uh, close into a household or in a family. We need to see them like a public good, like something that we as a society, we want to protect and we want to, to ensure that they have all the rights fulfilled and they, they are living in, in the well-being that they need for the love of their capacities. Uh, Ricardo, um, Macarena brings up a, a point that I, I, I think is sort of interesting, which is that for the most part in many governments, 
children are sort of seen as uh, component parts of their families, as, the, as being you know, their, their parents speak for them. And uh, I know on the global level, we often get pushback on children's rights issues from uh, governments who say, well, you know, children exercise their rights through their parents. But we found, um, especially in the context of this pandemic, that uh, often the child protection issues that arise in many cases stem from parents and the pressures that are put on parents as a result of uh, not having work, you know, the socioeconomic uh, impacts of these confinement procedures. So, uh, and I know this is a tough question, but uh, how do we uh, try to articulate the rights of, ch of children and the duties that we owe them individually separate from uh, their parents and, uh, and at the same time not, I guess, offend the, the parents by, um, by raising some issues in which parents are sort of the, uh, the source of the child protection issue. Yeah, the point is, as the Convention on the Rights of the Children is saying all the time, we have to have the interests of the children taken into account in any kind of measures. And of course, if it's going to affect the parents, we shall also take them into consideration. But at the end, we have to take into consideration in this uh, analysis that we do of any kind of problem that affects the children, so what their interests and the best interests on them uh, in any kind of measure that we take. And most of them, and probably 99% of them, will be something that the parents will support. And otherwise, then we have a problem. But uh, the problem is that sometimes, uh, because we have this mentality and it's complicated to change because it's a perception of the society and it will take many years to change, uh, we don't have these uh, rights of the children and this perspective in the center of our decisions. And that's the kind of mentality that, that the convention brings, uh, but still it will take years until we finally take their opinions as a their decision. I mean, for example, one, ex one example for me really clear uh, when this was this full debate with the lockdown in Spain about the difficulties of the parents to have a balance between their working life and their personal life. We always see how we can see measures in order to have this balance, but we never think what's the, the balance for the children. I mean, what's the best decision in order to guarantee the full rights of the children? Because uh, this conciliation or this uh, balance uh, has to be about that. It, it's not about how you can continue your work and your personal life. It's about how we can guarantee the best resources for the children and how they can be with their parents and how they can also, they can guarantee their rights. That should be the center of the, de of the debate. And we sometimes have some women rights on the table and it's important. We have worker rights on the table and it's important, but the end, we should have always taken into consideration the best interests of the children. And that's, for example, was not part of the public debate when we were debating about this. Kids were a problem to be fixed. They were uh, concerned, but they were a problem in this kind of working life balance. And that's the other point of view. We have to put the first analysis on their problems, their situation, their ch the children's rights, and then we see a solution you know, to guarantee all the rights. But otherwise, if we don't have this perspective on the children's rights, nothing will work. And that's the problem, how we put this perspective. And that's our uh, duty as uh, NGOs to guarantee in the public debate and also uh, the stakeholders that they have to take into consideration, A, there is a convention on the rights of the children. You have to have the best interest on the children taken into account all the time in any kind of decision. Um, Sarah Colantes, I was uh, taking that into consideration. I, I was sort of struck when you uh, had mentioned that you were able to set up permanent meetings on a weekly basis with members of parliament in, in Spain. In a lot of areas, I think um, civil society organizations especially would, would, would find that kind of you know, power, that kind of influence uh, relationship to be, uh, to be scarce. Uh, how did how did you do do that? Do, was that as a result of having built relationships with those members of parliament uh, prior to the crisis? Well, yes, uh, actually, the the relationships were already created. Of course, I mean, uh, it's uh, very difficult to go in the middle of a crisis, uh, be ready or be immediately ready to act or to or to strengthen this uh, this content, right? So this is the the first uh, point to 
to make. And on the other hand, uh, we also were quite surprised because there were um, a lot of interest of have from, from their side, not only from our side, but from their side to contact uh, us and other organizations. Is, I'm sure that and Ricardo also said that uh, uh, the members of parliament have been in contact with other organizations uh, in Spain. Because I think that we have lived in a kind of lack of generally, general lack of knowledge on the situation, surprise on the challenges. That uh, even, of course, the politicians felt that they needed information from first hand, that they needed to know what was, what was not going on in the field and they knew that we are in close contact with many organizations uh, doing intervention because in Spain in UNICEF is not charged of doing any kind of uh, direct uh, intervention with very small exception that I mentioned in my in my former presentation it, it, it was their their interest as well and there was also the after this the very first phase uh, a lot of activity in the parliament took place and this activity needs content and many MEPs don't have the content, particularly in this so new context, so new realities, right? So uh, it was such a, a, you know, a chance and that helps but a lot to uh, strengthen very, very much these relationships. And also I have to mention that we also had the, the opportunity to speak in front of one of the commissions of the parliament together with other organizations, including the platform. So we have had the chance to explain directly to MPs what was the situation and our proposals in the different uh, fields. Would you say, I mean, to be, I guess, crude about it, is it somewhat transactional of a relationship where the, uh, the, the civil society organizations can provide needed information that maybe these, uh, these policymakers don't have and in exchange the policymakers bring them into the discussion about the policy reform? Definitely. I mean, this always happens. I mean, it's not only in the COVID context, for sure. But uh, here it has happened quick with a lot of dynamism because of the huge policy measures taking in a in short time periods with no knowledge enough. So we really, I think that have tackled many barriers and work together. So uh, they were interested in knowing and we were interested in uh, creating political debate or pushing policy processes that were there, but they were too slow and suddenly started to go uh, quicker. So for sure that it has been a very win-win a uh, strategy and uh, with, I think, that uh, possible results. Um, Catalina Escribano, I'm interested, obviously, in, uh, in those uh, li listeners who are, are dialing in from countries that might not have the same kind of uh, democratic institutions as we're talking about in Spain and European countries and some more developed countries. One, uh, one thing that you mentioned was uh, the telematic response to uh, psychosocial needs and how the Red Cross uh, provided some of that. In many um, developing countries, it would seem like the only way that could be done would be through the national governments who control uh, the media in a lot of ways. Do you have any advice for how uh, what the Red Cross has done in terms of telematic response in Spain might be translated in those situations where maybe the government controls more of the media? Well, uh, the telematic response uh, I was I meant uh, you know like the attention and the, the the aid that we provide to the population was through. Um, you know online based and uh, but I, I don't think if i don't know if i understood correctly your question uh, you mean the, the government control on on the media hmm. well yeah if sometimes by virtue of the fact that just the government has the resources to provide things like connectivity or there may not have okay. connectivity what are some uh, some uh, alternatives that could be used by civil society organizations to do the very same support that might not have control of the the method yeah well, I, it's a very, very hard question to answer. <laughs> Actually, I, I don't know. Of, of course, in, in, in countries where the connection is not as good as in our countries, the only way is uh, the telephone. I, I can imagine, um, as far as I know, I, I, I mean, imagining mm. right now, but uh, I think in those countries, there are now uh, more, co uh, more uh, contact, physical contact than in our countries because they don't, they don't have any, any other way to, to 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 connect to each other 
and this is also this is also a problem uh, in in those countries because the contacts and the the lack of prevention for the the COVID. But um, the telephone would be the only, uh, and also in, in some some population in Spain they don't have uh, they don't have a possibility to 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 have connections because they don't have the money. So uh, with those people. Our volunteers went uh, just go to the places. Uh, they, they they have the the measure, the, the security measures, the, the the equipment, but uh, they have to go there and they have to communicate there or uh, or by the uh, telephone. That's the the way. Macarena Cespedes, the uh, one of the early ons in the in the sort of debates, the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. One of our our major. Uh, uh, advocacy points was to advocate that governments see child protective service workers as essential workers and provide them with um, the kinds of protective equipment so they could go and do the, the, the kinds of interventions that Catalina is talking about, go directly into those populations that don't have connectivity and try to make uh, connections and ensure that children uh, are, are, you know, are taken care of. Um, do you have any advice for how, how that has been how to translate that in terms of what the, the asks that we, we take to governments, uh, or if governments go ahead and allow them to be essential uh, service workers. I mean, do you have any advice for how we could use that, how we can use the essential uh, nature of those service workers to better monitor and, uh, and evaluate the situation for kids on the ground? You know, it was a big problem here also during the, during the crisis because uh, during the hard moment of the crisis, the social services was were closed at all or really understaffed. You know, it was it was something crazy because social and local entities uh, was developing the work that the, so, the social services has to do has to develop because it wasn't enough people to to follow up the the children, the the needs, and you know, and also the decision was taken quickly. To be honest, the, the, the government, the central, the central government took decisions quickly, but the implementation of this decision was so hard because, you know, we, we have like a, a one central government and 17 regional governments. And it was a little bit crazy how they implement the, the measures and how they spend the funding and all those things. And at the end, I think that it's a learning, it has to be a learning that we need to invest in the public goods, you know, we need to invest in health systems, in the healthcare system, we need to invest in education system, we need to invest in social protection system, because if not, those public goods are going to be broken in a, as, as, as far as the pandemic uh, broke us, you know, it was like, oh my God, uh, suddenly we, we don't have a, we, we need to close the schools and we discovered that our schools are from another century. They are not in the 21st century. They are not preparing for some of them. Yes, of course, there is some schools that are preparing for almost everything, but most of the schools are not prepared for uh, for something like uh, like this. And and also we need to, as as Catalina was telling us uh, here in Spain, we don't we, we don't have all the house with connectivity. We don't have all the families with uh, some uh, electronic uh, dispositives to attend the school online or whatever. I don't know. I think that uh, we need to learn that social service, social, social workers, education, health, all this public good has to be in our priorities now. I say it before, but I think that we have, to, we have an opportunity right now to change the system change the globality and to change the societies we are living in. Uh, and we need to take this opportunity because one thing is true, that the world is changing and it's changing so fast. And if we don't invest and we don't put the priorities in the well-being of the of people and in the rights of the people and in the rights of the child, we are gonna have problems one and one and and each other and other and other. And but I don't know how to con how to answer the question exactly because, of course, social workers and social system uh, social, uh, protection system are, are are very important. But to this this crisis, it was a, a gap in the Spanish context. I don't know in other contexts, but in the Spanish context, it was a gap, and 
thanks God, it was a lot of local entities and local NGOs and, uh, and, and not local national NGOs who was working as at Red Cross, Red Cross or another, another who can develop this role that is not really our role, but sometimes we have to do it. Well, I think that's a, a very, your statements are very good uh, closing of this conversation, but we should, uh, we should always remember this is an ongoing conversation and it's one that the uh, Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian in Action is uh, going to try to facilitate. So thank, thanks to all of you for being um, a part of this. For our, uh, our listeners, I just wanted to alert you that um, the information that has uh, been brought forward during this uh, webinar uh, and uh, one on Thursday, which will be the exact same sort of format, uh, but in Spanish for Spanish speaking um, uh, field teams. Uh, we'll, we intend to translate into uh, sort of guidance, very clear guidance, uh, advocacy guidance for practitioners, uh, which uh, will be available uh, on the Alliance's uh, website uh, very soon, specifically on the uh, advocacy working group uh, section of, of the website. So you can look for that uh, guidance uh, 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 shortly. Thanks again to everybody um, who was involved. I think this was really um, a good discussion, the beginning of a conversation that will hopefully continue and, uh, and be productive. And uh, our contact information uh, for me and for the, uh, the COVID-19 task team uh, will be available in a slide that we will be projecting for a few minutes before closing out this Zoom meeting. Thanks again, everybody. And for almost all of you, I'll see you on Thursday.